Hi, welcome to this Open Security Summit session in February 2023. And we have Nilet, which is going to talk about a very important topic, which we already covered you know, a little bit in the summit, which is about how to do it at scale. So it's all about security design and guiding at scale from real world experience in doing some really great stuff. Um, over to you, Nilet, and let's talk about scale and security. Thanks, Denise. When I think about design, the famous quote by Steve Jobs comes to my mind. Design is not just what it looks like and feels like. Design is how it works. A prominent design writer once said, thinking about design is hard, but not thinking about it can be disastrous. And this cannot be more true when it comes to security. Hi everyone, I'm Nilet DeMello, and I'm thrilled to be taking you on this exciting journey throughout this presentation about security design and guidance at scale. Before we get started, a legal disclaimer. All views, thoughts, and opinions expressed in this presentation belong solely to me and do not represent any of my employer, organization, committee, or other groups and individuals. A little bit about myself. I am a security engineer at Datadog, the modern monitoring and security platform that provides the ability to see inside any app, any, any stack, at any scale, anywhere. And at Datadog, I'm part of the security design and guidance team, where our sole focus is to build security into the DNA of the company. I work with several of our product and our service teams on their security design reviews, and most importantly, lead key efforts under the security design review automation, our knowledge bases, and the security ambassador initiative. Previously, I've worked at Intel uh, in the platform and infrastructure engineering space. But I had my first brush with security even before that, when I was working at McAfee, where I worked both in the enterprise and consumer business groups. But when I'm not doing security, I love to write. I share my learnings through my blogs, and I volunteer my time as an active mentor for computer science and software engineering undergrad and grad students at San Jose State. A high level overview of what we'll be covering today. There's a lot to cover. And first we'll be diving into the topic of insecure design. We'll see a few examples of it and also understand the effects of insecure design. Then we'll foray into Datadog's unique approach to security design and guidance domain in, in application security. And then I'll cover the challenges we faced with scaling security design and guidance. Talk a little bit about partnerships that helped in scaling this. Also, how did we measure our success and our failures? And then share the learnings from this evolving, exhilarating journey. There's a lot to cover here, and there is no one size fits all when it comes to this domain. Yet I hope that you, know, you all will be equipped with a greater understanding of the security design and guidance domain all the intersecting pillars of scaling it, what are the key partnerships that are going to yield the most return on investment, and also some notes on what works and what does not. Let's start with a bit of background on insecure design when it comes to building software, applications, and products. If there is one thing we have seen, is how massive hacks, breaches, digital scams, ransomware attacks are all rampant. And an approximation for US alone for PC Mac for 2022 reported about 1,802 total compromises, and most of which were data breaches. These affected about 422 million people. And alongside that, we have also seen a rise in software supply chain attacks as well. So really, as IBM put it in their 2022 data breach report, in an evolving threat landscape, time is money. So next, I want to briefly talk about two of such security incidents. Last year, in July, the Virginia Commonwealth University Health System, they posted a privacy violation notification on their website. 
where they acknowledged that the transplant donor information was included in the medical records for certain transplant recipients. And the transplant recipient information had also been included in the medical records of the transplant donors. And this information included names, social security numbers, lab results, medical record numbers, and date of birth. So really, a design security design flaw that caused such a privacy incident, and most importantly, it went undetected for 16 years. Here's another example about the Kinsing malware. Lately, we have been witnessing a rise in the number of attacks that target the container environments. And one such example is the Kinsing malware that is actively breaching Kubernetes clusters by leveraging known weaknesses in the container images and misconfigurations exposed in Postgres containers. And the Microsoft Defender Cloud team, they reported that they have seen an uptick lately indicating that threat actors are actively looking for specific entry points. A lot of this factors in security design considerations to minimize access to exposed containers by say IP allow list or following least privilege principles and also security design for databases to eliminate permissive settings and misconfigurations. So it wasn't a huge surprise when OWASP revised the top 10 list in 2021 and included insecure design as category number four in their list that focused on risks related to design flaw. And I think that's great. And I think that's great because a lot of security design considerations need us to think about other categories on the list and also see where they are applicable when we are designing, when we are architecting, when we are deploying, developing and deploying in accordance with it. So really what is insecure design? I would say it's a broad category and that needs more explanation to be more meaningful. But in a nutshell, uh, according to OWASP, it is missing or ineffective control design. It is the lack of business risk profiling and the failure to determine what level of security design is really required for what we are building. This is my favorite slide because let's think about the cost of insecure design. Really, what starts with security best practices not being followed early on results in security bugs. It results in security vulnerabilities. And it cascades. It cascades into internal security events and or maybe external incidents. And eventually, it results into security breaches. Ultimately, loss of reputation, precious customer trust, and revenue. And in 2003, a study conducted by, I think it was IBM along with NIST. So they, they conducted a study on the economics of fixing security bugs later in the software development life cycle, in the maintenance phase, as compared to the design phase. And there's a dramatic difference we see here, but that's 2003. Fast forward to 2023, 2023 is a cloud native agile environment way of working. We cannot even fathom the massive difference if we are fixing the security bugs early versus post implementation or deployment. And another factor here is that security cannot be retrofitted in software. So it's very, very important to account for it in the software design from early on. And also thinking about initial velocity versus sustained velocity, choosing not to account for critical security requirements early on can help your project velocity early on. But over the lifetime, it is eventually going to slow you down. That is the perfect canvas we have painted to dive into security design and guidance. Now at Datadoc, we handle and process trillions of data points per hour. And across our product in infrastructure, logs, APM, security, dig security and digital experiences, along with the different platform capabilities that we offer, there are thousands of services behind the scenes that are powering it all. And also our engineering workforce has grown over the year to support this growth. So that, that's a lot of scale we are talking about. We have also added thousands of customers who love and most importantly, trust Datadog. So naturally, 
product security is paramount for us because we are a cloud native fast growing agile company and to do so we incorporated security into the design of our products at the beginning stages of the software development life cycle and what it has done for us is it's allowed us to discover vulnerabilities and flaws sooner and address them rapidly now how have we done this let's consider a typical security develop a software development life cycle and let's see how we can make it secure really starting with the exploration phase there is an injection of security requirements then at the planning stage we are making sure that we are accounting for resources for security assessment once we know what we are building and we have kind of started working on that rfc that design doc that spec that's a great time to kick start the security design review perhaps do a threat modeling for a critical service and also understand how we are going to devise our security test plan after that in the development phase the code review also covers aspects of secure code review some aspects of security testing comes in form of internal pen tests and external pen tests pretty optional and in the in the operations and maintenance phase we are talking about security monitoring and incident response that's one thing but once a new feature comes in we also account for feature based security assessments that's just a high level overview but then let's talk about the security design review because that's the most important aspect of doing security design and guidance early on and when should you be doing a security design review design is not just a phase in sdlc um, everything we do throughout our the software development life cycle has some aspects of design involved in it the code we implement what we deploy it all needs careful design isn't it so it's fair to say that design review is appropriate in the following circumstances let's say when we are thinking of launching a new service or if we do a major update to an existing service any time we are doing a security sensitive service minor update and also it's also good to have periodic updates for our existing and security sensitive sub and also at that point you may have some supplemental data on vulnerability scans and things like that another observation for us has been that when you do security design review the scope can vary so adding levels has been helpful to scope it and establish clear expectations around the requirements the inputs and the outputs so speaking of levels i can point to three things maybe a team is looking for security consultation on a specific topic or maybe they have an rfc a design doc or a spec they want to review and want to dis discuss the security considerations and the third one is a team is looking for a full fledged assessment covering threat modeling mitigation strategies and security validation plan so accounting for these different levels is very important to make sure that we can fine tune our offerings for a security review and for all of this it is important to consider three key personas the developer i'm a developer why do i care what's in it for me well our developers want clear information about what to implement and how to verify the expected behaviors the security engineer someone like me as a security engineer i am mainly concerned with the overall security of the application and the infrastructure ecosystem now is the system in scope secure enough does it satisfy the compliance requirements and as a product owner or a business decision maker i care about what is the necessary action for this risk perhaps a tldr summary of the risk metrics its exploitability who owns those and what are the actions necessary for it so keeping these three key personas has helped us to refine things as we go and all of this investing the time of all these three personas primarily the developers the business owners decision makers it all comes down to the balance between cost and value and then cost can be also thought of in terms of the time or efforts that we spend and value is the return on investment on it 
And at the core of all of this, we would like to think about is residual risk. What's the portion of risk that's remaining after security measures have been applied? And really what matters is if it's increasing over time or if it's decreasing over time. So how did we start? Well, as a security design and guidance team, we initially started with a doc template for security reviews, mainly focusing on our high risk services. But as more and more review requests kept coming in, more and more teams started to get involved. It was evident that there was a lot of overhead in this process. Now, as things progressed, we were able to crank fewer and fewer reviews in terms of the efforts spent. There was no clear separation between levels and overall the time taken was far more. Hmm. We really needed to scale. And thus began our journey to scale security design and guidance. Now, as we started to rethink about things at scale, how do we how do we redesign security guidance at scale? It was pretty evident to us that it came down to three things, people, process, and tools. And we also realized that these three were interconnected. We needed all of these three to work in tandem for a successful outcome. So we started to build out our software tooling centered around automation and primarily self-service. Tools are great. So at a high level, a gist of various toolings and automations, but really what we were trying to do was achieve a process to support our security design review. So we started building a suite of tools. It all starts with gathering the service information. That's the first step. What's its data classification? What's the access control model? Who are the users? What are the use of existing security defaults and security paved path components for secrets, authentication, authorization? Once we have collected all of this, next comes the business risk profiling. What's the criticality of this service? And this is really important for us to gauge the tier of support that we can offer. You know, it allows us to better understand if a review can be self-served, if the security implications are minimal, or if it really needs our attention and a dedicated security engineer to work on it if the level of impact is high. Now, once we have done that, we kick start the security review. And the output of this reviews are risks identified, security requirements and mitigation plans. And all of this, again, by leveraging automation are captured in our bug and task tracking tool. Now, the next step for, for this is validation or verification. And in this process, we make sure to feel confident about the implementation as we design it. Now, we have built a set of tooling to automate this entire flow that allows us to do more reviews in a fewer time. Also, with making sure we have good prioritization and business risk profiling. Ultimately, I would also like to note that the design process will also involve numerous trade-offs between security, reliability, and the feature requirements. A huge part of this process that we talked about is the self-serve threat modeling tool that we built. This really serves as the base for establishing a premise upon which we iterate, which means given a set of inputs, my, the tool puts out a set of different things. And the clear focus of this tool here is to receive a set of inputs about the service and output the assets, threats, threat actors, and mitigations. Why, why do we need to focus on the third aspect here, the threat actors? We can better understand attacker motivations by taking people into account. Who are they? Whether they perform attacks for themselves or for someone else and general interests. A good mapping of actor, motive, action, and target. And all of this also has information about severity and residual risk. But at the core, four things, assets, threats, threat actors, and mitigations. Well, as engineers, we have come a long, long way in terms of thinking about reliability of our system. And reliability and security are both crucial for a trustworthy system. But building both reliability and security at scale is difficult because they do share common properties, many, many common properties, but also you need to think about different design considerations. 
so when designing for security we must assume that at any point an adversary could be trying to make things go wrong and that's why we started to equip our engineers with a, an understanding of core security controls that need to be applicable which of these need to be turned on which of these need to be turned off let's take a look at the core areas at a high level business logic the business logic is important because no service really operates in silo so making sure that our engineers and we understand the business logic and how can this be abused or misused is super critical second is what are we doing to enforce secure sdlc are there secure coding guidelines checklists that are really accessible is there guidance that's accessible at any point during the during the process what does the authentication and access control model look like what's the input and output handling processing look like what's the cryptographic usage for is there any implications are we are we are we thinking about crypto review here and then data protection and privacy that's also very important to consider what's the data classification for this service um and secrets handling really understanding what are different secrets that i'm working with what does that life cycle look like how am i rotating managing handling my secrets and last but not least we are very good at auditing for performance but what about security auditing so that's another thing so giving these core areas for our engineers has really helped us to bootstrap things without needing our intervention and also let's take a look at these four areas from the stride point of view if you look at stride spoofing how does the component authenticates towards the service and resources tampering does the component validate the message it receives repudiation is the component logging the interactions in an audit log information disclosure is the incoming and outgoing traffic encrypted and what protocols and algorithms are allowed denial of service is the component configured for high availability is it protected against ddos and also elevation of privilege are the users assigned the least privilege required so really thinking about these core areas and thinking from a stride point of view has been really helpful when we are having the conversations now we have looked at two pillars of scaling tools and process but i also mentioned the third pillar that's super important for all of this to work in tandem and that is people we need all three and that's where partnerships come into play starting with the developers and product teams and if we look at the graphic here really there is so many places that we need to partner and collaborate on it can be as simple as the the documentation tools the code the code tools that we use the video video tools or the messaging tools that we use or as simple as being in in the same room and communicating so really thinking about communication here and where it's happening is is really important our security design and guidance team is super lean so we needed to partner effectively to make sure that we are maximizing our returns so we emphasized strong relationships with our central teams teams that own the data platforms or the developer tools cloud infrastructure or authentication and authorization and along with that we knew that we wanted engineers in the product teams to get familiar and excited about security really the end game here was a desired change in interaction between us and our engineers really from like a software developer and security engineers interaction being is my product secure to the software developer saying i know it's secure because i have built it using the requirements that we agreed upon and we are getting there this is interesting because a crucial piece of scaling this and the partnerships has been our security ambassador program now this is commonly referred to as the security champions program in the industry we call it the security ambassador program and at a high level the scope of this program was to start establishing some consistency transparency a little bit of streamlined communication overall responsiveness and feedback for our overall security standards baselines assessments design reviews and remediations 
Most importantly, we wanted to enable the engineering and product teams to own the security and privacy of their service. So when we announced the launch of a quarter long pilot, we received an overwhelming response, but we were mindful enough of the fact that we should expect a percentage of dropout as the program kicks off and proceeds. And also to also to note here is this pilot required a bit of planning and marketing around the program overview across engineering. So there is a lot of upfront effort required when like really bootstrapping something like this. Here's a little bit of disclaimer. Generalized roles do not scale. Now, when it comes to roles and responsibilities, let me reiterate, generalized roles do not scale. We really want clear separations of roles and responsibilities. Like if we want to establish a strong sense of ownership, then we really need clear separations of roles and responsibilities. So we ended up tailoring three roles that were best suited for our agile way of working. First is the security ambassador. Security ambassadors are, are technical folks who are responsible for the security of their teams and products. Think about your individual contributors who are designing, architecting, implementing, and deploying the services. And we added four levels to this role, trainee, proficient, advanced, and expert. And this really was to make sure that folks who start this journey st feel comfortable when they're navigating it in a self-paced manner. But at the minimum, you need to finish the trainee level. And also we want them to cover the baseline training. As you progress after that, you start participating in security reviews and maybe cross, cross team security reviews and your trainings will also get a little more specialized. Well, the second role here is a security proponent role. And why we added this role? Because prioritization for security tasks can be really, really tricky. So if we, so we want to have a security proponent role. And a security proponent are folks within engineering who have the responsibility to ensure that security issues and tasks are handled in an appropriate time frame. And another thing is that needs influencing team priorities. So security proponents are often team leads, engineering managers, program managers, and so forth. There's something missing though, isn't it? So we added the security mentors as well. Security mentors are security engineers from different teams within security engineering at Datadog. Now, who are subject matter expertise in various areas of security? Think about cloud security. Think about infrastructure security, which is more geared towards Kubernetes, or really think about privacy and, and, and different areas, along with our security design guidance team as well. So they serve as trusted advisor for pairing up with the security ambassadors and security mentors and, and security proponents for discussing specific security concerns and ideas. And one consistent piece of feedback that we received so far from our ambassadors and proponents is the value that they found in having a security mentor that they met with on a frequent basis as they started this program. So really as a trainee, as a security ambassador, when you're at the trainee level, you really may or may not know what to expect, but having somebody to pair frequently to bounce ideas, to, to, to discuss your roadblocks, that can really get you through the trainee program really fast. And a large part of this efforts on scaling security design and guidance is education. Cannot underscore that. Now in our partnership with engineers from products and engineering teams, we have found that at least a baseline training is important. So what did we cover in these baseline trainings? First, a high level program overview that went over what's the program about? What are the expectations? What are the different personas that this program has? Second, a little bit of understanding of the security teams and the roles. This was super important because it helped folks understand what does the security engineering organization look like? What are the different teams in it? When should I approach a certain team for what kind of questions? What does the process look like for it? And things like that. How to work with the self serve security design and guidance tooling, super important because that's how we scale. We want to delegate a lot of these things to our ambassadors. And then how to conduct a security design review, going back to the way we use the automation tooling and also 
thinking about core areas. So we cover a lot of those core core areas that we spoke about a few slides back as part of this training. And then general threat modeling concepts. So that's sort of what a baseline training covers. And as we progressed, we ended up adding more advanced level trainings as well. But what next? When all is said and done, how did we how do we know that we are doing a good job? And how do we know that our ambassadors are ready to tackle some security design reviews and they are feeling comfortable about thinking about security control for their services? Right. And there's nothing like learning by doing. So we created a simple worksheet that looked something like this. And again, the feedback that we have received through our surveys has been that it's been widely helpful for simplifying this entire process for ambassadors. Really, it's structured as follows. You pick a service with a significant scope. Then you identify security controls for that service. This, this helped folks to take take a look at the security controls and go look at it where where can i find this in my code base where can i probably find it in my design doc so really help to bring it all together and then leveraging the automation for a self serve design re design review to make sure that all the the assets threats threat actors mitigations that part is covered as part of it and ultimately submitting all of this artifacts to the project tracking tool for us to review so it, it brought it all together. And one thing I will mention is that many of many folks paired with their security mentors from different teams to complete this exercise. Now, one thing I will however mention here is that vast majority of participants for them to get through this can be a little bit tricky because there's time considerations. Now, how about some lateral partnership? In order to get consistency, it meant that we needed to work more closely with other security engineering teams. And why did we need to do that? Because we needed to make sure that the skill sets and domain depth can be combined. So really, security design reviews that we perform is a little more proactive in nature. But then there is internal pen tests and, and other things like that that help us understand the exploitable flaws. The, the threat detection teams, they work on security signal creations. So that's another good feedback for feedback mechanism for us. And then we have the customer trust and safety teams who work on abuse and misuse case detection. So combining forces has helped us to really start improving on the output that we generate from our design reviews. Now coming together is just the beginning and keeping together is progress. Working together is success. So how do we measure progress? Because really as Peter Drucker said, what you measure improves, right? So measuring how we are scaling our work on security design and guidance over the past year has helped us to really clear bottlenecks and also increase the pace at which we cover in less time. So there's two kind of metrics that we think about, quantitative and qualitative. Quantitative metrics are the ones that are based and backed in actual numbers. For example, how many number of recurring findings in the same bug classes are we seeing? Or what's the time from finding to fixing? Now these can be easily tracked and measured, but also the qualitative feedback and qualitative metrics. These are gathered through feedback surveys, internal discussions, and so on. For example, how was the interaction with the security design and guidance team in terms of engagement? Were the requirements clear? Did it by any chance impact your velocity? So on and so forth. But making sure both quantitative and qualitative metrics are taken into consideration is super important. Now, it is said that to find ideas, we need to find problems. And to find problems, you need to talk to people. And in this case, our core customers are our developers. So it's crucial for us to measure the overall developer experience. Now, time and again, when measuring developer experience, we do not want to end up like this, where our expectations are really not matching the ground reality. 
nobody wants an experience with the security design team that is checklist communications and unwavering rules without clear exp explanations so we really prioritize understanding the systems and the interconnections well and explaining the rationale behind our security concerns and proposing solutions where our developers feel empowered to own and design and implement it because now they understand why it's important so keeping the developer experience at forefront has been informing many of the technical decisions that we as security engineers make with the security design and guidance work so we keep a close eye on a few things first is perceptions and sentiments second is the usability of our security tooling Third is the adoption of the security services that we built and initiatives that we launch. And fourth, the overall engineering velocity impact. Now, this has been years and months of work that I try to summarize over the past slides. And a lot of strategizing from our security leadership, a lot of planning and incremental work on several areas from us as security engineers in the team. So there was a lot that went under it. And so it was not a smooth sailing ride to say. We did encounter roadblocks and challenges and we did pivot accordingly. So that being said, there's like probably three key things I will highlight out here. When we rolled out the security design review automation, we received feedback from systems engineers who are working on infrastructure engineering, that the tooling could also be better tailored to their needs. And also in our self in our self serve threat model, as we collected inputs on a service, we were missing some key privacy review integrations in the loop uh, early on that allowed the privacy engineering team to understand that something's coming that's going to need their attention. So I'd also like to point out that seeking periodic feedback allowed us to catch this sooner rather than later and start incorporating these changes incrementally. So super important to seek feedback from internal customers. And also the, the third thing here is when we announced the security ambassador program, we received an overwhelming response and interest from folks who were looking to join. But however, as we were expecting, the dropout rates and enrollments showed and also enrollment showed signs of slowing down. So that meant for us that we needed to keep the momentum going and we needed to tweak things as we go. But all in all, all of these learnings were really great for us. And we ended up learning a lot from it. In summary, I have a few takeaways really reflecting upon a year of doing security design and guidance at the scale of Datadog. And I know that was a lot to take, but summing it up, start manually, focus on high risk components, because that's where you will get some clear indicators. And then once you have your learnings, leverage and build automation, keeping in mind that you want to scale. Third thing is partnerships are super important. You want to partner laterally with your security engineering teams and folks who work in different areas uh, of the security domain, as well as you want to partnership, partner with your developers, your business decision makers, keeping in mind what's in it for them, not just what's in it for you. And the fourth part here is security is a shared responsibility. So make sure to establish that premise in everything you're doing. And the last one is really measure what matters. Measure what's going to help you improve both quantitatively and qualitatively. That's pretty much it. There's a few additional helpful res resources that I personally like and recommend. The Building Secure and Reliable Systems book by Google. It's really nice. You can find a, an ebook online. The OWASP guide, the top 10 guide, is really important for anybody, again, to keep up. And then Datadog has their own security labs that's evolving with a lot of research on the security front. I personally refer to it most frequently. So that's a good one too. So yeah, some of my favorite resources right there. That being said, we come to the end of the presentation. I am open to some questions and answers.
No, it's, it's amazing, really, really cool like, to see all you know these activities. So I have a couple from my side on the, and if anybody has questions, please put it on the chat. I don't think there's been a lot there, but hey, uh, there's one that's come in a direct message. Okay. Yeah. Do you, do you want to do you want to go with the question first? Your question. No, first? no, you can go for that one first. Yeah. Okay. You start with that one first. Privacy review is difficult to integrate in security review process. How did the Datadoc team tackle it and which phase of the security review? That's a very good question. Um, as if I go back to the to the work to the the process that I mentioned where we do a service, the service classification, uh, get, getting information about the service that we are building and also the self-serve threat modeling tool. We collect information about uh, what what kind of data classification is applicable to this service. Is this data is this service going to handle any PII, PHI, and based on those rubrics, we make the our algorithm decides that this is this is where the privacy team is going to need to be involved, or at least they need to be aware that this service has these considerations. So right at the service information and business classification uh, process as well as the the self serve threat modeling one we have added hooks that send emails and we are also working on um, creating something that's going to put this on their their own radar as well in terms of their jira boards and things like that but um, yeah that's where we put the hook for it so as early as possible so how do you actually capture it? Like you, you put you know JSON in GitHub repos. You use Jira. You use other technologies. Do you use you know? Right now, right now it goes out as emails to the privacy team. Mm -hmm. Yes, and we are looking and we are looking to scale it further. But the step one here really is ident like here has been identifying where they need to be looped in and sending them uh, sending them that notification. Yeah, there were some really great sessions. There was one earlier today about threat modeling, you know, using code to create the diagrams. But also last summer, there were some really cool examples of trying to put some of that metadata directly on GitHub repos so that you then start to maintain it. So then the teams maintain it themselves, right? And then you just consume that and you start to visualize it, which is a, a great way. So we have an, another question. It's actually related to what I was going to ask too about. So what's different about your security ambassador program? And if anything, is the ambassadors, the champions, and then the mentors, right? Yes. So what's different about the security ambassador program? The, the way we have targeted different personas. Typically, when we are talking about security champions, there's just this one role, security champion. And there can be different participants here, like a, a developer or a business owner, um, a product manager or a manager in itself. They all are security champions. So there is no clear separation of security, what are the roles and expectations, as well as I haven't seen a lot of security mentors incorporated as part of security champions program. And that's a unique value proposition that we have seen really work, you know, clear expectations around roles and responsibilities. But in, in your one, this, you, the security ambassador is, is almost the first line, right? Yes, security, or security ambassador. Or the security champion. So you, you go from security ambassador to become a security champion, right? That's that's what we call our security champions. Uh, essentially, security ambassadors are security champions. Yeah, yeah. One of the models I've seen is that you start with with basically the security champions, which is the more informal one, and then the move to the ambassador is the move when he actually becomes part of somebody's actually job role, and they actually their bonus depends on it, and they they almost are more involved than just somebody who's enthusiastic or a point of contact where that's, it's actually part of their OKRs to do the security yes. stuff, right? And that's why, that's why within security ambassador role itself, we have levels where we have the yeah. trainee level, which is, yes, I just want to know all the baseline things that I need to know. But then you know, there are requirements that dictate if you will become proficient, there are requirements that say you're advanced and there, and there are requirements that you say expert. So there's levels just within that role itself that allows folks to progress depending on different criteria. Yeah, there yeah. is another question in here. Can you please say more about what you did to improve developer experience? You mentioned usability, but how did you address usability problem? Yeah, usability is kind of very tricky because 
if ultimately whatever tooling we are building even for for security purpose it think about it as a product what kind of features it's what kind of features it's offering where where it can be accessed so one thing we have really seen is the closer we we do things to the everyday workflows the the better it is to integrate so as further away you are from uh, the developers daily workflows it's harder and harder for them to to context switch between different things so as part of usability one thing we like we want to make it pretty seamless as close to the developer workflows as possible so um, our qualitative feedback surveys addressed some questions that allowed us to get some data around it yeah and also yeah. like how quantitatively as well you know we we had statistics around the usage of what we are building so you know tracking those usage metrics uh and seeing what's the improvement what's the decrease there so that was also really good have you guys done any gamification where you've got like dashboards and sort of you know a bit more of a interactive competition yes. healthy competition between the teams not exactly gamification but um, if if we see datadog has launched a set of security products as well and we dog food a lot of our um, our products too so how can we start to leverage these security products internally and start to address our own problems by by doing that and also provide feedback to the product teams as well so that that is a motivating factor that we are starting to establish uh, around it yeah do you have engineering resources inside the security team like developers and people who can actually build things Yes, yes. Uh, as the, the security design and guidance team spends fifty percent of its time doing engineering work, building tooling and and services, and then fifty percent of our time goes on ops work, doing security reviews. Because now we have scaled to a point where we have self serve mechanism, and um, and also the ambassadors are starting to at least you know get started with basic level reviews and things like that. So we spend. Our time fifty fifty, both engineering and ops work. Very nice. That's basically based on the SRE model, right? Is kind of very cool. So I think we have another um, one. Uh, you got the questions? Yeah, come in. Yep. How do you ensure that security pipelines do not become a bottleneck for dev experience? Parallel execution, decentralization of security pipelines, pipelines on only main trunk. Exactly. So this is this is a great question. Um, when we think about execution on security pipelines, there's two things. Uh, also, what kind of things we're executing? Are we running code scans to look for code vulnerabilities like SEMgrep rules or code QL rules? Or are we running um, cloud enforcement for, let's say, we have Terraform repos where um, we, write, we write infrastructure as code and we are doing some enforcement checks on and linting around it. So when we are thinking about these pipelines, are these pipelines blocking or non-blocking? That's super important. So we don't want blocking pipelines um, as such, but we want to provide feedback right uh, as, as the pull request goes through. So really considering that whenever we put something in place, none of that is blocking, like you can't proceed without it. So if you provide the feedback right on the pull request, but then it's not going to block you from really. Mm -hmm checking things in also so we trust our developers to make the right judgment uh, so i yeah. there's another question i do not interface with a security engineer how do i still learn to be more security minded yeah great question so really security is everybody's job these days as we think about reliability we also need to think about security so the oas top 10 is a great guide for it really to understand what what are the top 10 things at least to consider? So that's a great resource to get started. The, the Google book on building secure and reliable systems covers a lot of details on this topic. So I would highly recommend that as well. Uh, let's, let's see. Yeah, just a quick one on that one. So there's there's a lot of great resources, right? These days, on OWASP has great projects. Look, there's some of this, some amazing sessions. and. I also think that be involved, right? Be involved in open source projects, be involved with the teams. I'm sure that 
you know, you, you and the security team can do with all the help you can, right? So yes. I think the security space is so big that if, you know, the, the, the individuals are trying to get in this field, and I think, you know, we, we want as many as we can, right? Is uh, is find the sweet spot where you can add a lot of value, but you can learn a lot, right? And it's it's a fascinating field, right? And it's, it's getting more, even more interesting, more and more. Yes. Um, and then another thing, going back to the question of how do you ensure that security pipelines do not become a bottleneck, um, making sure that things that get scanned and the vulnerabilities that get tracked in the bug tracking tool, there is a clear sense of ownership established there. So um, making sure through the ambassador program, both the security ambassadors and the security proponents understand what that workflow looks like and what, how to remediate things, what action is required to be taken. A lot of that helps us to streamline things along there. So it's not just about that technical aspect. Like I said, tools, people, and process all need to work together in that case. Yep. I have a couple more little for you. I, I, I think we answered all the ones from the chat. I think so too. Yeah. Um, do you face cost of security in terms of dollars when designing security workflow? Are there recommended strategies to lower down the cost per day, per month, and are they measured in general when designing security? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, and again, if I go back, really, really, really go back to the start of my slide where I showed that dumpster fire, really, if you think about it, you're burning money. You know, it's not just that you burn money when, when there is a breach and and things like that. You you're burning money because developers' time costs you, your productivity costs you. So, um, going back to the question, do you factor costs of security in terms of dollars? Um, we like to think about what's the What's the value we are bringing and focusing, making sure that the efforts reflect that. So we are spending time working on really important things, prioritizing, saying yes to the things that are really going to bring high ROI and not just saying no and become a catch all for everything. Yeah. How does your guidance look like for checks introduced in the developer pipeline? Yeah. Now, speaking of guidance, uh, and there's another area that I did not cover in here, but we have a centralized security knowledge base project that our team also, we, we have guidance covering a lot of areas uh, around the core security controls and also mainly the checks that we introduce in the developer pipeline, you know, how, what those checks look for, and then how to interpret those results, how to, what kind of actions you should take. All of that guidance is captured and shared um, in in this in a centralized location. That's the security knowledge piece. Cool. So well, for me, so have you guys started using Chat GPT on your practices and uh, and activities? Oh, that's a tricky question. Really, because at this point we all are kind of trying to figure out what. Yeah, like there, there is aspects of where you can use these things to do your job. Like it, it's helpful, but you have to understand the implications of what you're asking it to do as well. So yeah. I personally use it for my own personal uses, but um, pretty much sure everyone does that, but not internally as such, you know. Okay. And then final question, what, what advice do you kind of give to somebody who's trying to get into the industry, if you're trying to you know, follow in your footsteps and uh, and is, you know, excited about this world, but, you know, you really want to, you know, join our cybersecurity sphere? Yeah, that's a great question. I, when I started uh, my journey into security, really, I was, I was super interested in this area because time and again, as we worked on things, as we built things, security issues started creeping in much later. And and we always wondered like why. So being a little curious about why certain issues are creeping up later and what can we do? So as, as an engineer starting to think about security pretty upfront, um, 
that helps you to be more security minded because now you get curious and start searching searching for resources to learn more about it you are implementing a feature a function you know starting to understand how to incorporate in output and input and output handling from a security standpoint so you start thinking about that you need to handle some authentication and authorization related logic you start looking a little bit more into it so you know at that feature level at the work you do starting to look for those opportunities to to understand and dive deep into it is a great way to learn by doing and then eventually once security field is also pretty vast so eventually figuring out where your where your interest lies or uh, that is going to help you like to figure out where you want to put your efforts in exactly right. i think you should align yourself with the areas you're really interested in isn't it yes, yes. brilliant thanks for this session and i think you had one of the best q and a's we had in a while it was brilliant thanks everybody for the questions and you definitely have to come back and let's do some more panels and other sessions this was really good so say hi to your team and i think we have one of your colleagues doing another session tomorrow uh I, although i think it might be, be early for you it's free 3 p.m. here, so yeah. I think it might be 5 a.m. What what um, I really like is how um, a lot of lot of these sessions are easily and quickly available on the YouTube itself, YouTube channel yeah. itself. So easy to catch up, and highly recommend folks to um, go catch it up if they miss on some sessions. Yeah, brilliant, great stuff. All right, uh, yeah, thanks everyone one. for attending. Bye. I hope you found it useful. Yeah, brilliant. Bye.